Part three of The Secret of Everyday Things by Jean Henri Fabre. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Marianne. Chapter seven Weaving. Examine a piece of cloth, woolen, cotton, or linen, and you will see that it is composed of two sets of threads which cross one another, each thread passing alternately over and under a transverse one. Of these two sets, one is called the warp, and the other the woof, or weft, and their crossing produces the woven fabric, or cloth. The work of weaving these threads into cloth is done by means of a loom. I will try to describe to you an old-fashioned hand-loom, which is much simpler in construction than the modern power-loom. A solid wooden framework supports a cylinder in front and one in the back, and these cylinders are turned each by a crank whenever needed. The front cylinder, its crank within reach of the operator seated ready for work, receives the woven stuff a little bit at a time. The other, fixed at the opposite end of the machine, is wound with threads, in regular order side by side. These threads will form the warp of the cloth, and they are stretched with careful regularity between the two cylinders the whole length of the machine. They are divided into two sets, the odd-numbered threads forming one set, the even-numbered threads the other. Two heddles hold the two sets and keep them separate, without possibility of intermingling. A heddle is a series of very fine metal wires, or it may be simply threads, stretched vertically between the two horizontal bars. The heddles are those two gridiron things in the middle of the loom, asked Claire. Precisely. At every wire or thread of the heddle there is passed, in order, through an eye or ring, one of the strands composing the two sets of the warp. Now notice that by means of two pedals or levers placed under the operator's feet, the two heddles can be made to rise and fall alternately. In this alternate movement they draw by turns, up and down, one the even threads and the other the odd threads of the warp. While the warp is thus slightly open, all the even threads on one side, all the odd on the other, the operator sends the shuttle through the space separating the two sets. The shuttle is a piece of boxwood, well polished, so as to slide easily, tapering at each end, enlarged in the middle, and provided with a cavity that holds a bobbin of thread, fixed on a very mobile axle. This thread unwinds automatically with the throwing of the shuttle, and is left lying between the two sets of the threads of the warp. Then with a the pressure of one of the pedals, the order of these sets is reversed, the threads that were above passing below, those below coming uppermost, and the shuttle sent in the opposite direction leaves another thread stretched across. This thread furnished by the shuttle, and passing by turns from right to left, and from left to right between the two lines of the warp, forms what is called the woof, or the weft, of the cloth. So the feet, said Marie, by pressing the pedals make the odd and even threads of the warp move up and down, while the hands, sending the shuttle from right to left and then from left to right, interlace the thread of the woof with the warp. That is the double movement the operator has to learn, the pressing of each foot in turn on the pedals, and the sending of the shuttle from one hand to the other. But in order that the cloth may acquire sufficient firmness, with no open spaces between the threads, these two movements are supplemented by a third. A comb-like instrument, called a reed, is used to beat up, or press close together, the threads of the woof, after every two or three passages of the shuttle through the warp, or sometimes after every passage, according to the nature of the fabric. Such, in short, my dear children, is the process by which all of our woven fabrics, of two sets of intercross threads, are made, cloth, linen, taffeta, calico, and a great many others. CHAPTER Eight, WOOLEN CLOTH I have just given you a general description of the art of weaving. Now I propose to add some details, relating to the more important products of the loom. And first let us take up woolen cloth. Woolen cloth is woven of woolen yarn. As it comes from the spinning wheel, or spinning jenny, this yarn has certain surface irregularities, little bristling fibers standing up and crinkling with the natural curliness characteristic of wool. In this state the yarn would check the easy gliding of the shuttle, which must shoot back and forth with great rapidity, 
and thus the work would be rendered laborious and the woven fabric wanting in evenness of texture the surface must be made as smooth and uniform as possible the fluff flattened and held down the whole length of the thread this is done by means of a preparation or facing with which the threads of both the woof and the warp are coated in this preparation are glue which holds down the fluff and oil which makes the surface slippery thus it is that as it comes from the loom cloth is badly soiled carrying as it does a coating of glue and ill-smelling oil before these impurities become seats of decay the cloth must be cleaned and it must be done as soon as possible the operation is carried out in a fulling mill which consists of a series of heavy wooden clubs or beaters set in motion by means of a wheel turning in a stream the beaters alternately rise and then fall with all their weight to the bottom of a trough continually sprinkled by a jet of clear water the cloth is placed in the trough where the clubs beat it one after another for whole days but this energetic beating is not enough the glue would disappear but not the oil which is more tenacious and on which the water has no effect accordingly recourse is had to a sort of rich earth fine and white which has the property of absorbing oil it is called fuller's earth that rich earth could be used then for taking out grease spots queried marie it is used for that purpose all you have to do is to cover the grease spot for a while with a layer of fuller's earth made into paste and the grease will disappear being absorbed by the clay in many countries it is used instead of soap for washing clothes what a funny kind of earth claire exclaimed i should like to wash with it what is it like it is a white clay greasy to the touch taking a polish when smoothed with the fingernail and mixing readily with water to which it gives a soapy look in france the best known fuller's earth is found in the department of indre isri and avrion beaten with this earth for a number of hours by the heavy clubs of the fulling mill the cloth loses the oil with which it is impregnated soap suds and finally pure water finish the cleaning but the part performed by the fulling mill is not limited to cleaning the cloth it also shrinks the goods to half the original width and nearly half the length in this connection i will call your attention to a precaution familiar to every good housewife before cutting out a garment she is careful to wet the cloth so as to shrink it as much as possible if this precaution were not taken the garment would shrink so in the first washing that you couldn't get into it that's what happened to emile's linen trousers said jules they came out of the wash so short they hardly reached to his knees a rope shrinks too when it is wet remarked marie once after a rain the clothesline in our back yard shrank so that it pulled out the hooks it was fastened to that reminds me of a little anecdote said uncle paul when shortened by being wet a rope exerts so strong a pull that not only can it extract hooks but it can lift immense weights it is said that pope sixtus the fifth when he was about to crete in one of the public squares of rome an obelisk brought from egypt at great expense ordered under pain of death the most profound silence during the operation so anxious were the operating engineers on account of the enormous weight to be moved i will tell you before going further that obelisks are tall slender four-sided columns engraved with a multitude of figures and crowned by a small pyramid they are in one piece of a very hard and fine-grained stone called granite their height not counting the pedestal that supports them may reach fifty metres and their weight may range between ten thousand and fifteen thousand hundredweight judge then whether the erection of this ponderous mass upon its pedestal did not present difficulties to operate in perfect unison the numerous ropes pulleys and levers used for raising the immense piece absolute silence was necessary so that not a word should distract the workman's attention the square was crowded with curious idlers watching this mighty exertion of mechanical power complete silence reigned every one bearing in mind the pope's order but when the raising of the obelisk had proceeded half way the enormous stone refused to go further and remained leaning with all its weight on the ropes everything was at a standstill the engineers at the end of their resources saw their gigantic task threatened with failure when suddenly from the midst of the crowd a man's voice rose at the peril of his life wet the ropes he cried wet the ropes 
They wet the ropes, and the obelisk soon stood upright on its pedestal. The tension of the cordage, when soaked with water, had itself done what an army of workmen had failed to accomplish. "'And what happened to the man who broke the silence?' asked Emile. The Pope willingly pardoned him, you may be sure. But let us return to our subject of woolen cloth. You can now easily understand what happens when this cloth is wet. It is made of crossed threads, each of which, on being soaked with water, acts like a rope. That is to say, it becomes shortened. The result of this is a closer texture. On drying, the cloth does not return to its original state, as a rope when dry resumes its former length. It remains close, because the threads, held in position by their interlacing, are not free to slip. Thus, by being put through the fulling mill, where it is beaten and wet at the same time, the cloth which was at first loose enough to show the daylight between its meshes becomes a firm piece of goods with warp and woof close together. The two sides of a piece of cloth are not the same. One, called the wrong side, shows the crossed threads of the fabric, otherwise known as the thread. The other, called the right side, is covered with a fine, even nap, all lying the same way. This nap is obtained by means of a kind of rude brush, made of the thorny burrs, furnished by a plant called teasel, or fuller's teasel. Teasel lives from one to two years. Its stalk, which attains the height of a man, is armed with strong hooked thorns, and bears at a certain distance apart pairs of large leaves, each forming a cup more or less deep in which rain gathers. Growing from the main stem are six or seven branches, each terminated by a strong elongated head, or burr, composed of hard scales, sharply pointed, and recurved at the end in the shape of a fine hook. The plant is cultivated expressly for its burrs, which are used in great quantities in cloth manufacture. It would be difficult to replace this natural brush with any similar tool made by our hands, for nothing could give the same degree of kneaded stiffness and suppleness combined. Five or six of these burrs are placed side by side, so as to form a brush, which is drawn over the cloth, always in the same direction. The thousand hooks of the teasel, each as fine as the slenderest needle, but elastic and supple, seize the tiny fibers of surface wool lying between the threads, and pull them out, lying them one on the other, all pointing the same way. The result of this operation is the nap, which on the right side of a piece of cloth covers and hides the thread. But this nap is still imperfect. Its tiny fibers are of unequal length, some long, some short, at haphazard, just as the hooks of the teasel brush drew them from the threads. To make it all smooth and even, it must be shorn. That is to say, large, broad-banded shears are used to pare down the surface of the cloth so as to leave the nap all of the desired length. This completes the essential part of the work. Sedan, Louvier, and Albu are the chief cloth manufacturing towns of France. Chapter 9. Moths. In our houses, continued Uncle Paul, we have a redoubtable enemy to woolen cloth and everything else that is made of wool, an enemy that in a very short time will reduce a costly garment to rags and tatters unless we are on our guard against the ravager. Therefore it is worth our while to make the acquaintance of this devourer of woolen goods, this despair of the housewife, in order that we may hunt it down with some success. You know the little white butterflies that come out in the evening, attracted by the light, and singe their wings in the lamp flame. They are the ravengers of woolen fabrics, the destroyers of broadcloth and other woolen stuffs. But those little butterflies, objected Claire, are feeble little creatures to tear in pieces anything so substantial as broadcloth. And for that very reason it is not the butterfly itself that we are afraid of. The delicate little flutterer is perfectly harmless, but before turning into a butterfly it is first a caterpillar, much like the silkworm, and this caterpillar is endowed with a voracious appetite that makes it gnaw substances apparently uneatable, such as wool, furs, skins, feathers, hair. To the caterpillar and its butterfly we give the name of moth. "'There are caterpillars, then, that eat cloth and even hair?' asked Marie. "'There are only too many of them,' was the reply. "'One of these caterpillars, one that some day will turn into a pretty little butterfly all powdered with silver dust, 
would feast right royally on your woollen frock, and another would find much to its taste your fur tippet, which keeps your shoulders warm in winter. There can't be much taste in a mouthful of fur, I should think, and it must be pretty hard to digest. I don't deny it, but these caterpillars have stomachs made expressly for that sort of diet, and they accommodate themselves to it pretty well. A worm that eats fur and digests hair knows nothing in the world so good, and one that gnaws old leather would turn away with aversion from a juicy pear, a piece of cheese, or a slice of ham, all of them repugnant to its taste. Every species has its preferences, and, according to its mode of life, possesses a stomach designed to find nutriment in substances apparently far from nutritious. On the moth's bill of fare are skins, leather, wool, woolen cloth, fur, and hair. The larvae do not merely feed on these materials, but it also makes from them a movable house, a sheath that covers its body, leaving the head free, and this house it carries about with it. All butterflies of the moth class have narrow wings bordered with an elegant fringe of silky hair and folded lengthwise on the back in repose. Of the three principal species, the distinguishing characteristics are as follows. The woolen moth has black upper wings tipped with white, while the head and lower wings are white. Its grub, or larva, is found in woolen goods, and it is there that it makes for itself a sheath from the bits of gnarled fabric. The fur moth has silver-gray upper wings with two little black dots on each. Its grub lives in fur goods, which it denudes a hair at a time. Finally, the hair moth lives, in its grub state, in the curled hair used for stuffing cushions and couches. Its color is of a uniform pale red. The moth most to be feared is the one that feeds on woolen cloth. Let us discuss its habits more in detail, for in spite of its ravages you will admire with me the skill it displays in making itself a coat. To protect itself so that it may live in peace, the grub fashions for itself a sheath from the bits of wool cut and chopped with its sharp little teeth. In thus cutting down these upstanding hairs, one by one, the worm shears the cloth and makes a threadbare spot. The shearman himself could not have operated with such nice precision, but there is nothing so disfiguring in new cloth as these shorn spots showing here and there the warp and woof of the fabric while all the rest retains its velvet finish. Furthermore, the mischief is not always confined to the shorn spots. Too often it happens that the tiny destroyer attacks the threads themselves and makes holes here and there in the cloth, so that the latter is found to be nothing but a worthless bundle of rags. The bits of wool thus cut away serve the worm either as food or as building material for its movable house, its sheath. This latter is most deftly put together, consisting on the outside of tiny bits of wool fastened together with a little liquid silk emitted by the worm, and on the inside of silk alone, so that a fine lining protects the creature's delicate skin from all rough contact. "'Just think of it!' exclaimed Jules. "'The detestable devourer of our woolen clothes lines its own coat with silk.' "'And that's not all,' continued Uncle Paul." the little creature indulges in the luxury of assorted colors. Its coat takes the hue of the cloth in process of destruction, and thus there are white coats, black coats, blue coats, and red coats, according to the color of the material. If this latter happens to be of variegated tints, the worm takes a bit of wool here and a bit there, making for itself a sort of harlequin outfit in which all the colors represented are mingled at haphazard. Meanwhile, the worm continues to grow, and its sheath becomes too short and too tight. To lengthen it is an easy matter. All that is required is to add new bits of wool at the end. But how is it to be made larger? If I had to do it, Claire replied, I should run my scissors down lengthwise, and in the opening I should insert another piece. The ingenious insect seems to have taken counsel of Claire, or of an even better tailor, said Uncle Paul. With its teeth for scissors, it cuts open its coat all down its length and inserts a new piece. So skillfully is this insertion made, so neatly are the seams sewed with the silk, that the most expert of dressmakers would find it hard to pick any flaw in the workmanship. "'These moth-worms must be very skillful, I admit,' said Marie, "'but I shouldn't like to have them practice their art on my clothes. How are they to be prevented?' To protect garments from moths, it is customary to place in our wardrobes certain strongly scented substances, such as pepper, camphor, tobacco. 
but the surest safeguard is to inspect the garments frequently shaking them and beating them and exposing them to the sun all moths love repose and darkness garments that are shaken occasionally and hung in the light are not at all to their taste but those that are laid away for months or years in a dark place offer just the kind of snug retreat they are looking for the ideal abode for the raising of a family go to your chests of drawers and your wardrobes very often and shake air and brush the contents then you will have no moths vigilance is here worth more than pepper and camphor finally kill all the little white butterflies you see fluttering about your rooms but those little butterflies do no harm whatever you told us objected emile it is only the worms that gnaw our clothes true enough but those butterflies will lay eggs by the hundred and from every egg will come a devouring worm the destruction of the flying moth means therefore deliverance from some hundreds of future moths end of part three